our system of government has collapsed. We have here appalling double standards. I know the family want it to, want it to end, just as much as I do, but I think it's about to explode. Hello, I'm Caroline Jones. Tonight's Australian story is about one man's relentless pursuit of justice. To some, he's an obsessive crackpot who sees conspiracies at every turn. To others, he's a hero, fearlessly fighting for the rights and freedom of us all. He's Kevin Lindeberg, and his 14-year crusade has even registered on the international scandal scale. This is his story. The people that I'm fighting against are people who have the levers of power at their hand. It's up to you. They have infinite power because it's the state. The consequences of if I win is dire for them. This is David and Goliath, and uh, Goliath has enormous resources, and David only has uh, one little human being. He's a pretty powerful human being. Kevin Lindeberg's been called a crackpot, an obsessive, he's been ridiculed. Who will fight for the right they adore. But then the fullness of time, everything he says turns out to be true. And I'll soon give you ten thousand. I just want to say to Kevin, sooner or later you've got to let this go. You can stand there with your finger in the dike saying, everyone on the other side of that is wrong. Or you can face the reality and let it go. Three little words changed my life. Those words were, they've been shredded. And when I challenged that extraordinary comment, my fate was sealed. I reckon when you get to Hearts Can Inspire... You yeah. can... I'd always loved singing, and so much that I had pursued it as a career, been professionally trained. And I think the last note, you can hold it on a bit longer. And then I had a choice between uh, joining the chorus of the opera or becoming a full-time trade union official. And I chose the latter because I thought that uh, it would give our family a more secure future. My member, the manager of the centre, gave evidence and uh, he wanted to see the Heiner Inquiry transcripts, he wanted to see the complaints against him, he had a right to see them pursuant to law. The change of government occurred, we put the government on notice that we wanted the documents, if we didn't get them we would go to court to get them. The government shut down the inquiry and shredded the documents. would have been an, a very simple matter to simply legislate retrospectively and to have made the Heiner inquiry, uh, you know, made it a, a proper inquiry. And how long did you work there? What we had was uh, union officials, the possibility that some people had been involved in illegal activity. I suspect the Goss government really was afraid of what might happen to some of its own uh, Labor Party members. I'm in no doubt at all that the decision to destroy the evidence taken by Heiner was an illegal act. 
This is like Watergate. This is like apartheid police in South Africa destroying records to hide their racial regime. This is about uh, Nazi gold issues. And those are the kinds of cases that Shreddergate is compared to. And it's right up there as one of the worst scandals in 20th century record keeping. At the time when the documents were shredded, I didn't know what was in them. But what I did know was that you cannot shred documents when you know they're required for court. And I objected to that. And I told my union that it was wrong. And obviously, um, I wasn't towing a line which the government and others inside the union wanted, and I was sacked. I want accountability, but I want, also, I want my job back so I can go back and serve my members. Why should I lose my job when I was doing my job, carrying out my duty to look after my members' interests? It's one of the reasons I've fought back. I didn't expect to be fighting back for 14 years. When Kevin was sacked, the main thing was to support the family. And so I immediately looked for a job myself. I didn't take it too seriously because I thought I'd be working for three months and then I'd be back home with the children. But in hindsight, um, a three months has stretched, stretched into 13 years and I'm still working in the same position. I was five. I think when it all first started. Um, I don't have a very good memory. I don't remember what happened. All I know is that one day mum was at work, one day dad was at home. Dad became the at-home mum, made us all lunches and took us to school. That's just how I've been brought up. I had my third child in 1992. I was back at work in about eight weeks and I had to hand over the new baby to Kevin at that time and I say he, he's been terrific with with Ryan and you know probably done as much as I could have done for him except breastfeed of course but um, uh, I would have liked to do it myself and uh, I feel I've missed out on that. People say well look well, you know why didn't you go and get another job right now um, my career was destroyed I was black from working within trade I tried to get other jobs in trade unions um, but I was a marked man. Heine became his full-time job, but at home. Bit of red, nice. It's just been an everyday thing. There's no escaping from it. I wake up, Dad goes and starts his work on the computer. You know, when I come home, he's still working on it, gets the phone calls late at night. It's just every day, all the time, non-stop. This is just what he does. It's his job. What Kevin Lindbergh did after he became aware of the destruction of the documents, he referred the issue to the appropriate bodies and various investigations took place. In this case, there's no doubt that the government knew the documents were required for court action at the time they shredded them. But they got in quick before the writ came. Once you've been put on notice and told not to shred, and then you go ahead and shred your documents to prevent them being used, well, you're, you're perverting the course of justice. It is one of the 14 great shredding scandals of the 20th century. The point uh, is that uh, the Library and Archives Act doesn't override the criminal. If it I mean, these things are not, they're, they're not in dispute. To say that the Cabinet would not have committed an offence is so basically flawed that if a first-year law student said that in an assignment, they would get a failure. But it appears to me, you know, what has occurred is that a, a range of people have been looking at spurious reasons to simply defend the cabinet.
the affair has never been fully and properly investigated in the context that I, as a police officer, use that word. That is, leave no stone unturned, endeavour to find the truth consistent with law. This has gone on like Blue Hills. I just don't believe that there needs to be any more taxpayers' money invested into this. Everybody's had a look at it. And I understand there's angst from Mr Lindeberg, but how many more inquiries do we want? If there had been, yes, this was wrong, we apologise and we're sorry, Kevin, this would have died years and years ago. It's been a systemic cover-up. This is going to be a, a running sore in Australia and a kind of international embarrassment. The Heiner affair is no longer just about the shredding of documents. The Heiner affair, like Watergate, is more about the cover-up. They twisted the law and allowed the cover-up to go on and on. And in that sense, that's why Heiner has become more important now than perhaps what it was in 1990. I've had a lot to do with whistleblowers over many years, particularly when I was in the Senate. I can't imagine anyone else who would have stayed with such an issue uh, given the insurmountable odds that were against him. He's also, of course, risked his own health. He's risked relationships within his family. This whole issue has taken over his life. Before it all happened, we had a fairly comfortable life compared to what it is now. You know, we had the company car, nice house with a swimming pool. We'd just been on our probably our first family holiday and then it happened and we've never had a holiday since and it's just been extremely difficult. Kevin would, would feel that the hand of God was guiding him, he would have a strong faith. And, um, you know, you can't argue against a strong faith. Good morning, inquiries. Can I help you? My mum didn't ask for this life and she didn't want to have to work so hard and to the point where her health is deteriorating and she gets severely stressed out. She, she thinks the way that a lot of people think, that what he's been doing has been stupid and foolish, you know, how, how dare someone of such, you know, middle class or whatever expect to try and make the government accountable. And you Thanks. Hey? You get the stuff out ready for tea, will you? Mm -hmm. Make out the table, right? Here, take out the knives and forks. Yeah. Do I send out the ones with Mum? Yes, mate. What has happened over the 14 years um, and what I've lost I can't bring back. I might as well keep going with things as they are. Got us on the high spirit, amen. Thank you all for the food and for the people who made it, amen. I don't feel angry with Kevin. I'm disappointed for him that it hasn't been resolved. I've got to get away early in the morning, Ryan. Well, what do you have to do? Well, because I've got other stuff I've got to do tomorrow, mate. I know the family wanted to, wanted to end just as much as I do, but perhaps more so than I do. Listen, i got to um, get off to the study and do some uh, work for the Senate. Okay. I'll finish up here. But uh, the more we've dug, the more serious we have found the matter to be. You just can't say, oh, look, um, I'll give it one more week and then we'll just cut it off. Um, I think it's about to explode. When the story of Heiner or Shredigate is written, the role of Bruce Grundy must be right up in the vanguard because without his courage, his commitment to investigative journalism, I don't believe we would be where we are today. I got involved in 1992 when we started the paper at the university's journalism school. 
When you shut down an inquiry into a youth detention centre and shred everything, there's a story. What I, what I want also is I want a background piece on Heiner, the inquiry. The students are committed to this project because they can see the outrage. I was wondering if I could speak to the attorney. I just want to ask him a few questions about the Heine inquiry. Back in about 2001, as we continued to shake the bush and publish whatever we could, a friend of mine was contacted by someone who said that uh, he, he was troubled by something that had happened out at the John Oxley Youth Centre when he was there. According to the uh, documents, it was the 24th of May, 1988. And he told us about a 14-year-old girl, this Aboriginal girl, who was taken on an outing with six boys into the middle of nowhere and left alone uh, without any supervision in this appallingly uh, rugged environment and was ra raped by uh, two of the boys and this matter had been covered up. That, that rock, see the rock is sloping back? That's where the, the girl was raped. Cut a long story short, we did find out the name of the girl and she agreed to go to this place with me. And so we walked in together. It was really, it's quite upsetting. So, sorry. Um, yeah, she was really quite upset, you know, because the memories kept, came flooding back as we went in. And uh, I did record some of that, and, sh and she was aware that I was recording it. And the audio, you know, it's pretty startling sort of stuff. They're supposed to be there to protect me. Bullshit. In the middle of nowhere. I just hope I'd stop dreaming about this and have a night nightmares about it. Cos nobody believed me them years ago. They went back to John Oxley and they did nothing for her, despite the fact that she said that she wanted action taken against the boys. They did nothing for her. One of my sources told me that he was interrogated by Mr Heiner about the pack rape of a girl. So um, certainly the transcript of his evidence, what he was asked and what he replied, would have gone down the gurgler. For any government to destroy documents when they know they're required for court is, one th is bad enough, but to destroy documents when they know it's about abuse of children in a state-run institution is utterly unforgivable. Wayne Goss and that cabinet would never have covered up any issues relating to abuse like that. That is a wild allegation. I have no, I've not seen from either of those two gentlemen any substantiation of that. And they should produce evidence. And I've seen none anywhere at any time. The, the business about them shredding documents involving child abuse was, was hidden. Well, there is no doubt that Kevin is right when he says it was a criminal offence to shred those documents. The problem is that nobody now, because the documents were shredded, knows what was in that inquiry. Uh, I guess Mr Heiner does, but he won't talk. At the time, it was about an inquiry into the management of the centre. Now, certain people knew that it touched on the abuse of children. So there is no hard evidence that that pack rape story was presented to the Heiner inquiry or that the Goss government knew about it and without that kind of hard evidence it simply will not come to court. Growing up there'd be times when I would just you know come into dad just lash out and be like you know, you've got to do this you've got to do that all you do is you sit on the computer you're on the phone all the time typing up stuff and nothing's happened you know dad when's it going to end? <laughs> But my view of Heiner has changed so much since I've gone to university. Whereas before I just saw it as a one man struggle, dad on the computer. Now, now I understand that it's so much more. I mean, I get taught about it at university. People across the world get taught about it at university. I mean, I never expected my child to be learning about matters that deeply affected our family. Because many of the bureaucrats in the system would have known about the existence of that material. I hope that 
um, you know that what she learns out of Heine stands her in good stead in her in, in her career. And if they did ask and they were told no, there's nothing in the system, then we have on our hands some serious lying. Now she's doing journalism because she wants to do journalism. Get as many as you can because we don't want to have to fill up your uh, your bags too often. And if she's in the class, um, well, I try and cover it in a way that doesn't cause her any embarrassment. And she's committed too. Matthew, you go, you go out this way, Naomi, you head up the hill now. It's given her an insight as to what we've been through as a family. She understands what her father is doing and um, she's very close to him. I'm really proud of my dad. I'm glad that, I mean, even though it's caused us a lot of pain and stress, I'm, I am really glad that he has kept on with this crusade. The fate of a Baptist minister accused of shredding a sex abuse victim's diary is in the hands of a Brisbane District Court jury. Douglas Ensby has pleaded not guilty to charges of attempting to pervert the course of justice and destroying evidence. Over the years, all kinds of legal authorities in Queensland have said there must be a legal proceeding underway at the time you destroy any evidence. Ensby's defence counsel said he couldn't be guilty. They have used that excuse to exonerate those who took part in the shredding and then suddenly out of the blue they charge a citizen with an offence that was said not to be an offence in the case of politicians and bureaucrats. A district court jury found Pastor Douglas Ensby guilty of attempting to pervert the course of justice. Justice Nick Samios said Ensby knew the pages might be required in judicial proceedings. While he was in no way involved in the Heiner matter, what the conviction of the Baptist pastor very, very clearly demonstrates is an endorsement of what Kevin Lindeberg and others have been saying for a long, long time. And the question we now ask, why should those members of the Cabinet not be prosecuted? We have here appalling double standards. Since the landmark Baptist Minister case, we're absolutely delighted that Mrs Bishop's inquiry into crime in the community is taken up this matter. It, it is just breathtaking to, to read reams and reams of cover-up. Our system of government has collapsed. It has now produced the greatest scandal this nation has seen in the last 100 years. At least two of those then cabinet ministers in the Goss government are still cabinet ministers in the Beattie government today. There's a federal election coming and Queensland's vital to it. I mean, Bronwyn is as bad as tough as you get when it comes to ugly, grubby politics. The game is well and truly up. Do the right thing. Obey the law. The corrupting tentacles of Heine are now so vast and so serious that the only way forward is for Parliament to appoint a special prosecutor, as happened in the Fitzgerald inquiry, as happened in Watergate, so that it looks totally into Heine, cleans the system out and restores public confidence in our public administration. You know what would happen, and I say this with great courtesy to Kevin, because I know he holds these views very strongly, if that didn't come up with what he wanted, he would believe that was too part of the conspiracy. Now, I didn't shoot John Kennedy and there's not going to be a special prosecutor either. I recognise that this committee's task is a heavy one, but if you have the courage to stand for what is right, I simply remind you of another wise comment. The truth shall set you free. After 14 years of struggle, I want to be free of Heine, but I will not go away until the truth is revealed to all. I have a great admiration for Kevin, but I really believe that um, he's achieved as much as can be achieved with this issue, and 
I, I do wish that he would move on uh, because I don't want to see him spend the rest of his life uh, being consumed by the issue. To that face. And I believe that now is time for Kevin to pick up his life and to become the creative person that he is rather than continuing with the issue. People might say, oh, you know, the Lindbergh's did they bang their heads against a brick wall. But I think history shows that corruption flourishes if good men do nothing. And, you know, if we hadn't seen it through or we don't see it through, then um, what it was all about will be lost. And I don't want that. There's only a few more things that he can do before he's done his bit. And so once that happens, well, that'll have to move on. There's no doubt that the events are converging to bring this matter to a head. It's reaching its end game. And uh, no, Lindbergh's not going to be uh, here 14 years time. I oh, know, he'll be with his grandchildren. Don't miss another intriguing Australian story next week. Coming up on Four Corners, the man who lived with Osama bin Laden and then became a spy for the CIA.